you ever hear somebody tell you a story and they just go through every single detail of what they're like, well, what was the cashier's name? I forget what day or the week it was. It's like, none of these details matter. They're not relevant. The only thing that matters is how a character transforms over time. Hi everyone, this is Ben Guest and welcome to the Creativity, Education and Leadership Podcast. I'm excited for today's episode because it is one of the best I've ever done. It's part one of my four part mini series on storytelling. And while today's topic is planning your writing before you actually start writing, it is really about the fundamentals of great storytelling. And the fundamentals of great storytelling apply to any medium in any genre, whether it's a TED talk, a movie, a story you're telling your friends, a memoir, or a piece of popular fiction writing. Future episodes are gonna cover writing, editing, and publishing. My co-host for all four episodes is Greg Larson. Greg is an author who published his memoir, Clubby, about his time as a minor league clubhouse attendant last year. Greg was one of my first interviews for this podcast and was a phenomenal guest. As I was finishing my own memoir, Zen in the Art of Coaching Basketball, Greg's advice was invaluable. So I pitched Greg on doing a four-part mini-series on every aspect of publishing. Greg has a ton of experience in the publishing world, having written, ghostwritten, and edited over 80 books. And he now has a company called Self-Publishing Sherpa, which helps entrepreneurs publish their stories. So Greg knows the industry inside and out. Three quick notes before we begin. One, Greg and I recorded these episodes a few months ago. So you'll hear me talk about Zen and the Art of Coaching Basketball as I'm revising it, even though it's now been out for about three months. Two, this episode has my first advertisement and it's for Greg's company, Self Publishing Sherpa. So you'll hear that about halfway through the episode. And three, please take a minute to sign up for my free weekly newsletter that has interviews just like this one. That's at benbo.substack.com. Benbo's my family nickname, B-E-N-B-O. So benbo.substack.com. Okay, again, this is one of the best episodes I've ever done. It's a deep dive into the fundamentals of great storytelling as told through the lens of how to plan your story. Enjoy. Planning obviously is the beginning of the creative process. Greg, what are your thoughts about planning? In general, I think a lot of authors get stuck in the planning stage. What I find is people try to make a perfect outline. For example, when I advise people in nonfiction, my my entire thought process is just create an outline that will remind you what you need to write in two months. That's it. So like, don't write your book in the outline, none of that kind of stuff. But like, even before you get into the outline, figuring out who your audience is, figuring out who your ideal reader is in the audience, figuring out what your goals with the book are and figuring out how you want your reader to change. This is more strictly nonfiction, but figuring out how you want your reader to change. Those are incredibly important aspects of the planning process that I think a lot of people overlook. Let's start there and let's start with nonfiction and we'll probably jump over to fiction as well at some point, but we'll, we'll try to signpost that. So in nonfiction, I think the key question to ask yourself at the beginning is what you just said. Who is this written for? And I think the mistake a lot of people make is I had an interesting experience or I've had an interesting life or I had an interesting business or I met this person or whatever. It's great that it's interesting to you. If you want to write that down for your kids, for your family, for your best friend, great, do that. But in terms of connecting to someone who doesn't know you and has no connection to you, You have to ask, who is this for? Tied to that, what do I want them to get out of it? A book with no audience is a diary, which is perfectly fine and valid, but it doesn't need to be published as a book necessarily. The way I think about it, especially with memoir, a lot of people think that a memoir is, is a series of things that happen. People think, you ever hear somebody tell you a story and they just go through every single detail of what they're like, well, what was the cashier's name? I forget what day or the week it was. It's like, none of these details matter. They're not relevant. The only thing that matters is how a character transforms over time and the story that gets them to transform. So when you look back through your life and you're interested in writing a memoir about it, you have to think, what is the shortest period of time in which I had the greatest transformation? That is how you answer that. So what question for the reader, I think. Once you're able to put a time frame on it, even if you're not writing a memoir, any kind of nonfiction where you have personal stories inside of it, you once you have a tight time frame around it of 
I started out as a, a, a new clubhouse attendant in a minor league baseball team. And I ended as like a grizzled veteran. Boom. Like I have a constrained time frame that I can work with. So we're talking about both a compressed time frame and as importantly, the greatest amount of change that happened in that compressed time frame. That is what makes the most compelling stories, I believe. If we talk about storytelling tradition, I mean, if we go back to Aristotle and poetics, it's unity of time, place, and action. Everything should happen over three days and two nights. I'm a big fan of the, the film director, Michael Mann, who did Heat and Miami Vice and Last of the Mohicans. And he's like, basically, you want your story to be the most important few days, few weeks, few months, whatever it is, of your hero's life. It is the key moment of their adult life or, or even their childhood. What happened in those moments that changed them? And in that specific detail, it'll become relatable. Yes. Yeah, exactly. People try to become, a lot of authors, they'll try to become universal by being vague or not trying to, not trying to exclude anybody with too many details. It's like, no, the uni universality is found in specifics. Right. And so just to highlight this for the listener, we just said earlier, remember how you hear a boring story and the person tells you every little detail? And the flip side of that is, so that's a story with too much information. The flip side of that is once you've nailed down the time frame and once you've nailed down the experience, now you want as much specific detail as possible and not to go jet like, well, it needs to be more general so people can relate. For some reason, the way we're wired to connect and empathize with somebody, the more specific detail the person gives, the more we relate to it. The, of the right details, for sure. Like I, I see this as a problem in a lot of literary fiction and literary nonfiction where authors will, it's like this self-congratulating scene building. The reader doesn't always need to see everything. If a couple of characters are in, say, an arcade or something, a person generally knows what an arcade looks like. But if you're, if you're zeroing the focus into a specific detail, make it for a reason. Otherwise, it's just showing off. It's just like literary gymnastics. But that's more into the craft of writing, not the prep preparation as much. Right. No, I agree 100% with that. So the keys in the early stages, uh, in, the, in the beginning stage, is... What's the experience, compressed time frame, greatest change, and who's the audience? And within that audience, who's my ideal reader? And what's the impact I want, I want this to have on my ideal reader? And what's the impact I want this to have on my life too? Talk That's an important that. part that I think a lot of people miss. You should be selfish in this part of the planning process. Yes, you might be writing it. Again, we're focused on nonfiction. Yeah, you might be writing it a nonfiction book to teach to teach people something specific. Maybe it's prescriptive nonfiction, whatever it may be. But you need to have a selfish, specific goal for yourself. If it is getting speaking events, if it is being having more newsletter subscribers, having a larger following on social media, whatever it is, that's an important aspect of this process because you need to have an incentive to keep going that is somewhat selfish. So with Clubby, what was your side of that? And what was the audience side of that? For the most part, when I was, I was blind writing clubby, learned through air. I didn't know how to do a lot of this stuff yet. But as far as audience goes, I had a specific idea in my mind of the audience. I was like, my audience member, because I could, with baseball, I could have gone so deep into statistics that it would have alienated certain people. But then if I would have been too, assumed too much ignorance on the part of my reader, it would have alienated even more people. So I was like, my ideal reader knows what an, earned run averages and what a batting average is, but they don't know the significance of say a wins above replacement or the more obscure metrics. That was the knowledge level that I was working with. It's a baseball fan who knows earned run average and batting average. And that's the way I wrote it. But as far as like my specific goals, they, I was not articulating those to myself just yet. I don't think I was as nuanced in my planning process at that point. When you started, when you started your outline for Clubby, did you have a theme in mind in the way that huh. in, in a piece of fiction writing generally we'll create a theme? Yeah. The theme was minor league baseball players are taken advantage of and look at what that world is like. And I mm. wrote and I, I outlined, oh, this is this is what their love life is like. That's one chapter. This is how the Dominicans are treated. And then this is how they handle the off season, that kind of stuff. And I wrote a rough draft in that way. And it was just boring. It was impersonal. It just didn't work. But then when I started writing it more as narrative nonfiction, as a memoir, 
I did this weird thing where I had two Google documents, a Google document on the right with just chaos notes. I chopped up some of the old boring pieces that I thought might be useful, threw it into this note document. I had little fragments of little notes. I would scribble in class and I would type it up in there. And then on the other Word document, I had, it wasn't even a draft. I was just starting to write what was happening in the story. I wasn't writing prose. I was basically just writing summary. Like I drive down to Florida. I meet with the team. I meet X, Y, and Z here. And I kept doing that. And then what happened was it naturally just turned into prose. And I didn't try to, but like, as I went on more and more, I was like, oh, I know I know what the dialogue is here because I have the notes on this side of the screen and I know what's happening. And then eventually by the end of it, I was just writing a full draft. By the time I got finished with that full draft, I could go back to the beginning and I say, oh, I know what this prose is supposed to be. So it was almost like writing half of a draft and then going back and writing the first half of the draft. And that seemed to work. Yeah, there's a phrase I heard once. I think it was something like jumping out of an airplane and, and sewing the parachute together as you're in the air. That's kind of what you yeah. did, right? Like just kind of jumping in, putting it together. And by the time you get to the end, now I can go back and finish the beginning. Yeah, dude, I hadn't thought of this. I love that metaphor as well, but I hadn't thought mm. of this metaphor or this analogy before until like the last week. We were talking about therapy before we started recording. In the first draft, like when I'm in a therapy session, I'm just like saying whatever comes to my mind and I'm making connections that my unconscious mind is making that I don't recognize. Then it's my therapist who says, here's what's happening here. In the first draft, I'm the crazy person in the chair, just making connections, just trying to trust my gut intuition, free association as much as possible. And then in the second draft and the third draft, I'm like the therapist where because now I'm outside of it, I can see what I was trying to do much better. And I had never, it's that realization helped me recognize or like more easily trust my instincts in the first draft. That is so great because one of the things that the therapist is doing, the professional is doing is finding patterns and helping you see patterns, right? Yes. So now the yeah. patient side of it is we're just throwing stuff out there, right? So the to go back to writing, we're, we're throwing stuff on the page, thoughts, ideas, quotes, fragments. And then the therapist side of it is we're, we're finding the through line. Okay. So let me, and sorry, as, as I've mentioned in, on previous podcasts, there's some construction going above my apartment. So you may hear random little banging sound, so forth. Let's jump over to the fiction side. And yeah. so one of the things I did over the pandemic was I wrote a screenplay and it's a zombie movie because in some ways, COVID, the pandemic, it was like living in a zombie apocalypse where this thing is spreading and coming and so forth. And the theme that I came up with was the idea that everything changes. True in normal times, and obviously even more so when you're living through a pandemic. Everything changes. You had a normal life, and now everything has changed. And so the reason I'm mentioning that in the outlining process is I have that phrase, everything changes. That's my theme for this screenplay that I'm going to write. And now I have that at the top of my outline because I want that either consciously or subconsciously to just be working as I'm doing my planning, because that's the heart of the piece and everything needs to be in service of reaching that. And it may never be explicitly stated in the screenplay, right? It may never be explicitly stated in the theoretical movie. It's, it should all be residing there in, in the intent of the writer. Yeah. My version, I like that idea. I've heard a guy I really look up to, he did the same thing where he would write, he, his word was vulnerability. I mean, he just wrote vulnerability on a post-it and he always had it on his computer so that everything you write, if it wasn't in service of that word, he would cut it out no matter how good it was. And he had a lot of success in his book. For me, like- And, and, the, and the book of, was eight pages long. <laughs> right. I'm not telling you guys anything about myself. My, my version of that is I have a question that I'm trying to answer. And like the book that I'm working, the novel that I'm working on right now, my question that I'm trying to answer is how do our, how do our relationships with our parents impact our romantic relationships? Because sometimes I hesitate to start with an explicit theme because then it's almost like I'm starting with an answer before I even ask a question. I want to just explore the question and see and surprise myself in a certain way too. It's scary because I don't always know where this book is going and it surprises me, but it also makes it more exciting. I love that. One thing that I want to be clear about is there are many different paths up the mountain, right? As many authors as there are, that's as many paths 
up the mountain to completing your work that there are. And so I like this idea of just sort of comparing our different processes. And again, in the detail, people will find things that they can relate to. So I love the idea of start with a question and then you're you're going to start working towards answering that question. I need to have the structure of knowing where this is going. And it sounds like for you, you don't need to have that. Oh, I'm at least trying not to. The novel that I'm writing, I think I've technically tried it. This is the third time. And I didn't really know that I was that this is really the third time. But I, looking back in the past, I can see, oh, I tried to tell this in some way. The first time I tried it was four, four years ago. And I legit had no plan whatsoever, like no plan whatsoever. I was just writing words. And then what came out were just like fragments of chaos. And it wasn't a book. It was just like a series of thoughts. The difference now is that I have a rough scale. I have a rough idea of where of the ending. And I have a rough idea of this question that I'm trying to answer. But what I'm allowing, what I'm allowing myself to have is to discover new characters along the way. That's been the biggest one where these two characters are are in a summer camp. And I think it's all about this love story of these two characters in a summer camp falling in love for the first time. But then lo and behold, that the manager of this camp actually becomes a really prominent figure, even though I didn't realize this was going to happen. And so now I'm not going to say, well, it wasn't in the outline, so I'm not going to have this character. It's like, no, I discovered this guy and he needs to be a fully developed character as well. That's been the biggest difference in this iteration of this novel. That's fantastic because that's also part of the magic. Like that's the spooky side of it, right? Okay. So if we're talking actionable items, I guess, for for the listeners, for people that are interested in writing a piece of nonfiction, memoir, what have biography, what have you think of the most transformative time in your life and the lesson or lessons you learned in that time. From there, think about how would you like, if you were to write this experience down, if you were to create a piece of art around this experience, how would you like that to impact someone else? Someone you don't even know, someone reading this story, what's the takeaway you want them to have? And then from there, think about what are your goals for writing this book and who's your ideal reader? Who are you writing for day to day? Yep. Is that, I, does that cover it? I, I think that's, th- those are the most important questions to ask. I would call that the, the positioning part of the process. What the questions you need to answer, ask yourself and to answer before you go into the outlining process. Yeah, I think that covers it. And then on the fiction side, and again, many different paths up the mountain, I think two ways to do it. One is to think of what is a, what is a theme, uh, like everything changes, that I want to explore, that I want to process, that I want to think about? What is a question I have? How do, how do our parents impact our relationships with, significant, with our, our romantic relationships? So what's a question I have now? How do I want to explore that? So start with it. One way would be to start with a theme. Another way would be to start with a question. Outlining. How do you outline? So for nonfiction... I'd say this applies to both more uh, prescriptive nonfiction and narrative nonfiction, but I start with brainstorming a table of contents, not, not even thinking about it as a table of contents, but just brainstorming the main stories and brainstorming the main lessons that I want to evoke in the book. I try to come up with a minimum of 20 and then inevitably it's going to get condensed down and you're going to add more. But have, starting with 20, I think, is a really good starting point. And then once you have uh, those 20 uh, brainstormed chapter topics, not even think about them as like chapter titles. Ty- people get obsessed with chapter titles way too early and it gets them stuck. But once you have those chapter topics, again, don't even worry about order and structure yet. I just I, I use a table in Google Docs where... I have chapter topic, and then I have either a thesis or a question that I'm trying to answer in the chapter, as in like, what overall point am I trying to make in this chapter, slash what question am I trying to answer in this chapter? And then I come up with a hook. Your mileage may vary, but I've never seen anybody successfully write a nonfiction book after coaching 100 plus people who has written a basically written their book in the outline. I haven't seen anyone do it successfully yet. I'm sure somebody does, but just like, sentence fragments in the outline. What's the hook? Story of getting fired from fintech company. Boom. That's the hook. I'll remember that when I go to write it. And then I do, what's the chapter? What are the stories or anecdotes or examples in the chapter that I want to tell? 
What are the points I want to make? What are the actions I want the reader to take based on those points that I'm making? Those are the biggest ones. Most people just tell stories and they don't have any takeaways. Uh, an even smaller percentage of people have stories and then have the takeaways. An even tinier percentage has stories, takeaways, and actions, actions to take. That's like the key to writing excellent nonfiction, I think. And can you say a little bit more about the actions to take? That yeah, for sure. Like that's exactly what we're doing in this podcast. It's a perfect example of it. We're talking like abstractly, but then you're saying, okay, based on what we said, here's what, here's the action you should take. An example, my, my, I helped my friend edit his book that's written for young men in their twenties who are trying to find their way in life after college. And he had a story about him moving to Austin and not knowing how to make friends. And that's a well, that's an interesting story. But then he said, the takeaway is that you need to treat everybody as though they're a friend until they prove otherwise. Boom, there's a takeaway. There's like an aphorism that they can use. And then he had an action for them to take. He's like, create like a customer management system for friends. And here's how I do it. Here's how you can do it. So it's like he had a story, a takeaway and an action, a specific action for them to take. And what I've found is that people who write nonfiction more often than not, they think that the things that they know are way more useless than they are. But it's like, if you're an expert in something, even if your expertise is in your own life, you're more often going to dismiss what you know, just because you are an expert. It seems obvious and easy to you because you're the expert, but to a reader or a listener, you have to lay it out explicitly. And that's valuable. For I love it. And when you're doing this kind of outline, you, you personally, pen and paper, computer, note cards, what? I do it on a Google Drive document mm -hmm. and I have a template that I use that I can just repeat. I can like copy and paste these tables so that all of the, all of the segmenting off is already filled in. You know, it's like, oh, there's a box for stories and there's a box for points, that kind of thing. That's how I use it. And then I write the draft. I'm writing my current novel on a legal pad on... <laughs> but I would never write nonfiction on legal pad. I think, I don't know why exactly, but a narrative story I'd write on. The... Nice. So just to recap. So one of the advantages actually with nonfiction is basically, you know, the ending, right? You, yeah. if, if you've selected this transformative moment in your life, or you and I have both done ghostwriting and co-authoring someone else's life, the transformative event or events, but, but generally you want to keep it as tight as possible, the lesson they learned from that, or the, the the lesson, the life lesson, I guess. If you know that, you know how it ends, you know what you want to communicate, that's then going to help you when you come up with the chapter topics, because something that takes a detour off that main road probably doesn't need to be go any further. Probably so, but I, I want to make an important distinction here. The difference between a memoir and prescriptive nonfiction. A memoir is explicitly a, a narrative. It's nonfiction written with all the tenets of good fiction, character, scene, plot, all that stuff. That's a different beast in a certain kind of way. And that should be constrained time uh, in a time frame. Whereas prescriptive nonfiction, which is the type of like how-to books, self-help books, business books, that kind of thing, they're going to have memoir elements of stories and stuff, but it doesn't need to be as constrained. It just needs to be constrained by the topic so like those stories can be plucked from all different aspects of your life. They both serve different purposes. The the prescriptive writing, like you're saying, there's lots of room for lots of different types of topics and lots of yes. different stories and lots of different examples. And the overall theme can be as narrow or as wide as you want to make it. Yes, exactly. Okay, if we jump over to fiction. So if I go back to my to my zombie apocalypse. Um, screenplay. So now what I now I have my theme, everything changes. So now what I do is I'm going to come up with the characters. Huh. And I'm going to come up with their backstory, kind of music they like. Are they an introvert or an extrovert? Do they have a lot of friends or just a few friends? What what kind of movie? What's their favorite movie? Just some information. When I then do act one, act two, act three, I have something to generate why this person is doing this thing in this moment. Do you use character diamonds? No. Talk to me about that. It's like a screenwriting tool that I've been trying to use for fiction. I'm not super familiar with it, but in general, a character diamond, it's like a four pointed diamond, the same kind of diamond you'd see on a ski hill, like double diamond, you know, like a character diamond you have at the very top of a diamond, like the point of 
the, a four pointed diamond you might see on a ski hill. At the very top is the primary trait of the character or their North Star, what they want more than anything else in the world. And then opposing it is their mask, like the version of themselves that they show the world that they would probably never admit to themselves. And then on the other side, on the on the horizontal points, on one end is their non-negotiable, like the thing that they're, the, the hill that they're willing to die on. And then on the other end is their fatal flaw. And the theory behind it that I've learned or that I'm trying to like understand more completely is that the more opposed each of those points in the diamond are, the more strong that character will be. An example, like Han Solo, I guess. Han Solo's primary trait, he's a, he's a maverick, cowboy, space bounty hunter. Uh, that's his primary trait. And then his shadow or his mask is that he's like, he's an emotionless swashbuckler. His fatal flaw, I think that he is money hungry and that he would do anything for money. But the hill he's willing to die on is that he, his friends. So it's like, these things are somewhat opposed. I'm sure I'm fucking up the, the top, the vertical diamonds points, but we're learning as we go here. But like the more opposed these things are, the, the stronger the character. And like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand that relative to fiction writing. Right. So that is a great framework because storytelling is almost always involves conflict, right? Internal conflict yeah. and external conflict. So that's a great way to figure out both the character's internal conflict and then find things that are going to spark external conflict. This episode is brought to you by Self-Publishing Sherpa. If you're a busy entrepreneur, coach, or consultant, and you'd like to grow your business with a book, let's talk. Yes, this is Greg Larson, the guest on this episode, and here's the deal. Writing a good book is easy, but good books don't grow your business. Writing a great book that attracts new clients is hard, really hard. Editing is even harder. Add in cover design, interior layout, publishing, and marketing, and it's enough to keep you from writing a single word at all. Whether you already have your manuscript finished or you haven't written since high school, let our team of experts handle everything for you. In six months, yes, just six months, you'll go from book idea to holding your book in your hands ready to make you money. To learn more, visit selfpublishingsherpa.com where you can schedule a free, no sales, no extra nonsense BS call, a free outlining call to get started. That's selfpublishingsherpa.com. I think the most important is knowing, deciding what your character really wants because that's usually going to drive um, the actions they take and that will eventually drive the conflict. Mamet, David Mamet says, you know, each scene should be, what does the hero want? Why doesn't she get it? What happens next, right? That, that the character, until the character gets what they want, which doesn't happen until the very end of the story, you're always going to have forward plot momentum. So to use our Star Wars idea, Luke Skywalker in the first Star Wars, Luke Skywalker wants to leave home and go on an adventure, right? Mm -hmm. He gets that, not necessarily in the way that he was initially thinking, but that's eventually what he gets by the end of the film. The details for these characters, like their backgrounds and stuff, sometimes you just have to know that as the author, but your reader mm -hmm. doesn't have to know that. How do you discern which of which, which goes in and which just is for you? I saw an interview with Tarantino about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And in that film, Leonardo DiCaprio's character is on a 50s western tv show called bounty law mm. it's not really important in terms of when you're watching the film they just cut to it a few times tarantino said he wrote six episodes of bounty law wow. just so he would know exactly what the show is that this character had been the lead actor on that the movie's not even about it's not about the lead actor <laughs> it's not about leonardo being in bounty law it's about 10 years later when leonardo's kind of losing his career and i'm sure there are other authors that just just have a really light sketch so for me, I, I like to be somewhere in the middle. I don't want to spend all this time thinking about, you know, what, what do they major in college? But I do like to just have some gen, and, and there are certain things like music or your favorite movie that if you know that, that that's kind of what you need to know to sketch the character out. So, so for me, it's, I have like an iceberg that has a third of uh, underneath, like one third above and two thirds underneath, something like that, maybe. Gotcha. But you keep those things to yourself for the most part. Yeah, I, I would say the ratio of what you know versus what you reveal is, is again, sorry for the hammer, is, I don't know, one to six probably. You know, so, yeah. okay, I know this character's favorite movie is Aladdin. There's a one in six chance that at some point that's going to be mentioned somewhere or referenced somewhere in the story. What about character in terms of 
nonfiction or in terms of memoir? So for my most recent memoir, I did a lot of interviews with the guys that were going to be characterized in the book. It's an interesting balance to play. The characters are real people. And so in the first draft, I kind of had to think about it in sociopathic terms. Like, I'm not going to think about the ramifications of telling these stories on the real people. I'll think about that in the edit. Um, And so the first draft, or I should say the first draft of my memoir as an actual narrative memoir I had stuff in there about people that I eventually cut out because I was like, this is wildly inappropriate inside clubhouse stuff. That was just even beyond inside baseball. It was just like, might've ruined marriages kind of stuff. And I was like, this is just not worth it. But at the same time, I was, I was looking at it through the lens of what did I see? Anything that I see or hear is my, is mine to own from then on. And anything that I could discover online, I would try to figure out as much as possible. I don't know, man. It, that's a hard, it's a hard question to answer because you're confined by who somebody really is and like who somebody was as you saw them at that time. I didn't do it real consciously. Right. And that's one of the that's one of the things you always have to think about with real people is, you know, this is my perception of one side of them or one side of their mask even. And this thing I'm creating is going to live forever and putting that in quotation marks in the world. So I think that that tactic that you mentioned is exactly right. In the planning stages, when it's just you and you, 100% honesty and openness about everything. Right now, it's just stuff you're throwing on the metaphorical page and it doesn't ever need to go further than that. But early on, I think actually until you get to the editing phase, honesty is the best policy. And the more open and the more honest, the better. Yes. I mean, you're going to be honest throughout the entire process, but it's just a matter of how much you reveal. Right. Yeah. That's a better way to put it. hundred percent. Okay. So now we've got our carrot. We've got our theme. We have our question. We have our audience. We have our goals. We have our characters. I was curious, actually, you mentioned the three act structure in Mm. screenwriting. Mm -hmm. And that's another one of those things. I'm like, man, does, how much does that apply to like novel writing? Where, where did you learn the three act structure and how did you start implementing it? Sure. So the, the most famous, I guess, in, interpretation is Joseph Campbell, right? The hero's journey. So act one would be leaving home. Luke Skywalker's aunt and uncle are killed and he's, you know, flies off to the stars. And then act two is discovering the new world and ends with the lowest point. So in Star Wars, it's when Obi-Wan is killed. And then act three is triumph. Usually you get what you wanted, but not in the way you wanted. You've changed as a person and you bring peace back to the land or whatever it is. The Matrix kind of fits that perfectly where Neo, at the end of act one would be is when Neo goes leaves the matrix is pulled out of the matrix Mm -hmm. then act two he's learning this new world and the end of act two is when morpheus is captured it's the low point and then act three is the triumph the really but i like to make it even simpler and so i go back to mamet david mamet who said act one is you you get your character up a tree act two is you light the tree on fire (sighs) and so it's just each scene should lead into the next scene and generally the scene should lead into the next scene because the character isn't getting something. So if we if we go back to Mammoth's idea of up a tree, tree on fire, then the, the character is going to reach a stumbling block, and then a character is going to reach a much bigger stumbling block. Those are, your, those are your ends of Act 1 and Act 2. So let me ask you, does that translate into fiction writing and, and memoir writing? I'm trying to think in my own mind now. If I'm doing it well, like that's the thing is right. I think, well, well, two things. Did you learn that? Like, did you learn that from uh, what's it called? The Hero of a Thousand Faces? Right. And, that, that, I don't know. Yeah, that, that, that's the Joseph Campbell book. I haven't read that book, but there's plenty of work that's been done off of it. Yeah, 100%. But did you find that framework somewhere somewhere else? Yeah, just online. There, there's a bunch gotcha. of stuff on the hero's journey. And there, there's sort of a, a circle diagram that sort of you just follow the circle in terms of the the events that can happen in that type of story. So like as far as like memoir, like does that framework hold up for memoir. Here's some mistakes that I made when writing both my my memoirs is that I wasn't thinking about it in terms of those like really tightly defined storytelling elements. I was just trying to write a story interestingly, but I didn't even, a fatal flaw with literary fiction and literary nonfiction is that they focus more on character than story, which, you know, Mm. they're not mutually exclusive, but I was focusing more on like the internal 
transformations of the characters, which is interesting, but it didn't always have, like when you read upmarket fiction, you can tell that each chapter is like the cliffhanger at the end of an episode of a really great TV show. And it keeps you going more and more. And like, that's not an accident. And it's a formula that I'm trying to learn, but I don't even know how to learn it exactly yet. I'm just trying to write this novel that I'm writing. I'm just trying to write each scene in a way that somebody transforms in some little way at the end of it. And that we get a little bit closer to what I think the ending is without wasting the reader's time and like trying to do it as beautifully as possible. So, so to that idea, then the, the impetus to keep going is every scene I read in Greg's book, I'm learning a little something. Yeah. There's a little nugget of truth. Uh, uh, of a life lesson in there is that well that would be more for prescriptive nonfiction. but if, if i'm thinking of a narrative of a memoir or a novel i don't know that there even needs to be a life lesson it's just the character develops so the plot advances a little bit farther but with prescriptive nonfiction, ideally it would be some kind of life it would be some kind of life lesson because a, a reader isn't reading a self-help book or a how-to book to learn about character to watch a character develop they're reading it so that their own characters can develop oddly enough and so in order to do that you have to help them transform at the end of the chapter i'd never made that connection before but that's (laughs) a a prescriptive nonfiction book is a book in which the hero is the reader oh that's deep that's fantastic and and the hero is going on a journey the reader is going on a journey hopefully or they're going to take steps to go on a journey Oh, I like that. So for my, I'm working on a memoir right now about coaching basketball, coaching high school in the States and then professionally, quote unquote, overseas in in Namibia in Southern Africa. So what I try to do there is each scene, each chapter should have enough forward plot momentum that it makes you want to read the next chapter very, very light cliffhangers. That's kind of how I think about it in in memoir writing, that there needs to be, why is the reader going to turn a page? What are your thoughts about it with memoir? I look back at my my old work and I kind of cringe because I I would do it so differently now. But what I tried to do with my most recent memoir was end each chapter in a way that it's like I would I would be in scene for most of the chapters. We're in the clubhouse, we're on the field, and I'm describing details in a way that you can actually put yourself there. And then at the end of each chapter, I would try to, to zoom out a little bit and not say, this is what it meant. And when I was there, I would do something more like, let me grab, I can find an example here. Hmm. Love it. Hold the floor. Available at fine independent bookstores near you. That's exactly Or right. even... Even better, signed by the author online. That's right, at clubbybook.com. So this is this is the end of uh, chapter 11, where I am in the middle of two seasons. It's the off-season, and we spend a lot of time in my off-season home in South Carolina with my girlfriend and like our relationship troubles. And it's like, am I going to go back to baseball or am I going to stay in South Carolina? And it's like, well, there's another half of the book, so we kind of know what's going to happen. But um, <laughs> So we're in scene in the house for most of the chapter. And then at the very end, I decide that I'm going to go back. And there's these final couple of paragraphs where I sort of like zoom out and I'll read a few sentences. And just like that, I packed my things into the caddy for the drive north. Nicole and I renewed our lease. So I was coming right back there once the season finished. We said goodbye to each other, just like we had so many times before. Aberdeen had been just a memory. So now I'm, I'm zooming back a little bit. I never thought I'd actually return there any more than I'd return to my youth, but I looked forward to the season in a certain way. Like when you do the same things over and over again, expecting something to be fundamentally different because it's always the next meal, the next fuck, the next Christmas that will finally make you happy, the next baseball season, because this is all you know how to do. You don't ask the sun why you orbit, you just orbit. You let the gravitational waves of the baseball season pull you in and you surrender yourself happily. You slap on your faded blue stretch fit BP cap with the orange cursive A on the crown, and you drive your Cadillac from one single story brick rambler to another somewhere just off the I-95 corridor in Maryland. And so like, there's this, there's this zooming out that I think I wasn't consciously doing that, but that's how I, that was how I would give the reader a cliffhanger. It was like scene, 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 zoom out for a little bit of oh, here's the meaning of what happened without saying like, here's the meaning of what happened. And I think that kept some momentum going, even though I didn't realize that's what I was doing. That's such a great framework, Greg. So uh, to, to my mind, the best <clears throat> storytellers 
out there are the folks at This American Life, the, mm -hmm. the radio program. Their framework is exactly that, right? Seeing, seeing, seeing what's the bigger meaning behind this. Seeing, seeing, seeing what's the bigger. And that's it. That's exactly what it is. So that I think is a is a beautiful way to to end the chapter and to sort of plug into people's naturally wanting to make connections, hear a story and understand what the greater connection is, the greater meaning. Yes. And I, I found that readers were actually ups, upset or at least inquisitive about the parts where I didn't zoom out and provide the greater meaning. And I wanted to be like, well, just look at what, just look at the action and discern for yourself. But they wanted my guidance as the author, which totally makes sense. So I, I again, I can look back and see places that I would have done it differently. What chapter was that the end of? Chapter 11. Okay. Out of so 20. In, in your outline, what is what did the chapter 11 outline look like? If I recall correctly, I did not have anything like, oh, expand out at the very end of the chapters. Like, no, I think it was just literally, I said off season. And then I wrote a bunch of fragmented details of come back, come back to South Carolina, find mess. Nicole and I argue like that kind of stuff. It was not, it was chaos in a certain kind of way, but like, that's right. how I think about it. It's like, Writing a writing a book is taking like the chaos of my ideas into the order of a right right back back to our therapy analogy randomness of this this and this okay where where's the pattern in it okay so the the next thing that I do if I go back to my to my screenplay and my acts yeah. right so act one so if we do the the zombie movie act one is when the zombies start taking over the world and this fam this father and his two teenage kids have to find shelter. That's the end of act one. And then the end of act two is the father has a medical condition. I gave him meningitis and he needs to have a shot of penicillin to, to save him. So now the kids are going to have to leave the shelter that they sought out. Okay. So just act one, act two, and then in act three, the father dies, but the, the daughter who's the main character comes to accept that everything changes. And then what I'm going to do is is plot out scene by scene. Okay, S scene one is going to start in the, the chemistry lab at the high school. Scene two is going to be the hallway in the locker room. Scene three is going to be the wrestling mat. And then I, I have the characters who are in that scene and the point of that scene. And now to your point about the, the diagram, the character diamond, on the left-hand side, of the outline for each scene. Vertically, I write each of the characters in that scene once. And then vertically on the right side, and I think this is the key, and this is going back to something you said really early on in this conversation. On the right side, I write down, what is the emotion I want the audience to be feeling in this scene? Do I want them laughing, scared, nervous, whatever? All of that translates to any kind of storytelling, I think, except maybe prescriptive in terms of what is the emotional feeling? What is the emotion I want the audience to have at this moment? Do you know how many scenes you're going to have in each act? Like, do you set that aside beforehand or know an ideal? No, I, generally for me, it's like 10, 10, and 10. It's, it's like a third, a third, a third. But it can, you know, depending on, again, many paths, many stories, right? I mean, the other thing with, with especially with fiction writing so if we not screenplay writing but fiction writing and memoir it's also like the story is going to tell you how to tell it because we haven't even gone into non-linear storytelling but right. in some ways as you're working through the story it will also reveal to you the way in which you should tell that story right i like that like i like the screenwriting tendency because screenwriting has to be way more succinct than these other forms of writing so like you have to be like totally mm -hmm. dialed in that dialed in process i don't even start that until the, the editing phase in the drafting phase i'm just like have a rough idea and fucking bang it out mm -hmm. but i like i, I want to use that in my editing process because i can be too slipshod with like oh what exact point or emotion are we trying to evoke i'm just trying to think of this the the memoir i'm working on now how i outline that so it's 21 chapters and, and you said yours was 20 chat club was 20 chapters right yep so similar number of chapters and then i know the events that are happening in chronological order first game of the playoffs is a chapter and then 
maybe just sort of the, the two or three key moments I want to hit in that chapter. And that's it. It's, are, are you going off of like a journal or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. that's invaluable. I honestly, invaluable. I don't know how people would write a memoir without having something like that. What's, what's really funny, Greg, is so it covers two, two basketball seasons. And I kept my journal the second season. And the second season, like everybody, you know, all, all, all my early readers, they're all like, man, the second half of the book just moves in a hmm. good way. And I'm like, yeah, it's because I had so much, you know, I had so much of that iceberg to work from. And the first half, I'm trying to remember conversations from five years ago. Right. So what, did you have a lot of summary in the first half of the book? Or were you yeah. still able to build? So the, the biggest thing, actually, I was working on this this morning, is just kind of going back. And this goes back to screenplay writing of the idea of show, don't tell, right? Like, yes, I was just doing a lot of telling. And now basically, I'm just going back and recreating dialogue to make it more in the moment. Show versus tell is an important comparison. This thing that I learned in school that was really helpful distinction on that was scene versus summary of like mm. scene building of a, of a story with dialogue and summary of here's what happened. I went, I went to the store that day and I bought a apple juice, that kind of stuff. And another one, I mean, this is getting more into the craft of actually storytelling, but like, uh, action is character is one of the biggest ones that I stuck with or that um, one of my teachers taught me from F Scott Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. That's been a big one. Like don't tell the, don't tell the reader who somebody else just show it to them. I mean, if you have to tell the reader, you're a shitty storyteller, right? You should right. be able to show the character by the action. I want to talk about one part of the planning process that I haven't mentioned yet. That is like so important yeah. that a lot of people screw up and I screw like I teach people how to do this and I still screw it up. You can have all this stuff, right. And you still forget about writing a great book, but like not even finishing your first draft ever. You can do all of this, right. And just, and just not write your words because of anxieties getting in the way. And because of all kinds of stuff, the way I think about it, you need a writing plan accountability and a rewards system in order to get your book, regardless of what genre you're working in. So like the way I think about it is this, like a writing plan, how many words per day are you going to write? And are you going to be writing on only weekdays? Are you going to be writing only on weekends? Are you going to do seven days a week? That's your writing plan. Where are you going to write? What time of day are you going to write? And like actually putting it in your Google or Outlook calendar, or whatever it may be. You're and so you have a specific word count that you have to reach every single week, for example. For me, it's two pages per weekday, so 10 pages per week. My goal is two pages a day, that turns into 10 pages, 10 written pages per week. So like that's that's my writing plan. And then the accountability, this is where a lot of people mess up. Like you have to have accountability in order to finish your book, I think. My accountability is that I send a video of the 10 pages I've written to my friend, my business partner, Alex, every Friday at 6.30 PM to prove that I've actually written the book. And like those little details matter a lot because then all of a sudden I have somebody that's like, I don't know, he'll, I don't know if he even cares or would be disappointed, but I would be disappointed if I didn't have him to send to him. And then the rewards and punishment, like if I do that every week, I reward myself. Like for me, it's, I go get like barbecue or I go to a buffet or something. And then the punishment is I send him a hundred dollars if I don't do it. I think a lot of authors mess that up because th those are like the, the work day technicalities of actually getting your words down on the page. I don't know if it's going to turn into an amazing book, but I know that it's going to get me a finished book. And that's way better than an unfinished book. That's the end of episode one. My guest was Greg Larson. I'm Ben Guest. Please take a minute and subscribe to my newsletter where I have weekly posts and interviews just like this one. It's benbo.substack.com. B-E-N-B-O.substack.com. Benbo.substack.com. Totally free. You get one email a week with a post or a link to my podcast interview, write up about book sales, creativity, it's self-publishing, etc. Benbo.substack.com. Next week's episode, part two, is on the writing process. Have a great week.